Today I'm going to show you something extremely useful that you can make using an old power window motor. I happen to have two on hand, but you can find them at auto salvage yards and the cost is minimal. Let's head inside so I can show you exactly what I made. The power window motor you see right here is from my Hyundai Sonata. It's a 2003. I had a problem with one of the windows closing, so it was actually cheaper for me to purchase a new regulator with the power window motor than it was to keep the power window motor and just get a regulator. If you're going to be doing this, I recommend using a power window motor that's less than 20 years old. Some of the older styles operate differently when they're placed under a load and those motors may not work. What's really good about these motors is the size is very small. My hand is covering it all up. They're very low profile, only about one inch or 25 millimeters in thickness excluding the gear that sticks out, which is on the other side that you'll see in a minute. This side over here where the motor is is just slightly thicker. These motors have very high torque because of the design. It's a worm gear. Right over here you can see what a worm gear looks like. The smaller gear at the top rotates the larger gear. As a result of the worm gear, the motor is going to spin that worm very fast and it's going to rotate the larger gear much slower and you're going to end up with a lot of torque on the opposite side where it connects to the window regulator. So being the type of a person that likes to recycle things, I had to come up with a use for these motors. Over the years of doing construction work, working on AC systems, as well as many automobiles, I decided to put together what you see right here. This tool could be kept in the trunk of my car or in my shop, and any time I run into a problem where I have very limited space, and I need to undo a bolt, or maybe drill a pilot hole, or drill a hole through studs if there's only very limited space between the studs where you could not normally get a drill, this will allow me to do it. So let me show you how I wired it all up, and then I'm going to take it outside and give you four great demonstrations. The power supply for this motor uses an accessory socket either in your vehicle or portable power station. There's a 10 amp fuse inside this holder, the wire is 16 gauge, it's 12 feet, and it ties into the switch. I'll show you exactly how it's connected in just a minute. If you do not want to use this with an accessory socket, you can also use a switch mode power supply, plugs into your AC receptacle, and converts that AC input to a 12 volt to 14 volt DC output with a rating of around 8 amps. You'll be able to use your AC receptacle to power this motor. You can also take a battery like you see over here. It's a lithium polymer. It's flat and it has a lot of power and it could easily be secured with Velcro to this flat side of the motor. And then when it's connected to the motor, you can use XT60 connectors like you see right over here. And you can have a quick connect that will allow you to have this completely cordless so you can reach inside of a wall, maybe underneath a sink, and then you could do some work. When you want to charge it, you simply unplug the XT60 connector and use a charger like you see right over here. Let's take a look at the opposite side. So in order to make this work, let me flip this around. Over here is where the power window motor harness was plugged in. I cut away the top of this connector, so it made it very easy for me to solder two wires, positive and negative. And it doesn't make a difference which is where, because you're going to see in just a minute how it was done with this switch. On this side of the motor, you can see the large gear would be underneath this cover. And over here is the worm. And right here where this socket has been bonded using epoxy resin is where the gear would tie into the window regulator. And you can see that right over here in this image, what the gear looks like. And what I needed to do is take this socket and secure it onto that gear right in the center. And the way I did that was using one of these O-ratchet sockets. So both sides are open, like you see right over here. This is a 3 quarter inch socket. If you were to flip this over, it would have an 11 16 socket on the opposite side. Both are 6 point. So all I did was slide it over. The gear was just slightly larger than the socket. It made marks on the gear, which I shaved down with a wood chisel. And then once it was the correct shape for the socket to slide over, I put some epoxy resin on the teeth of the gear and slid down the socket. The next thing I did on this side with the three quarter inch six point socket opening, 
I needed a bolt or the head of a bolt to slide into that three quarter inch six point socket. So I took a bolt, I cut the head off, and then I connected or brazed this three eighth inch by quarter inch ratchet adapter. You can see right over here in this picture how the two went together. Once that was done, I slid it inside the socket nice and deep, and I put some JB Weld all the way around the connection to ensure that it does not come apart. And that is all I did. The way the motor works, very simple. If positive is in one side and negative is in the other, it's going to spin in one direction. When you reverse the two wires or the polarity, the positive and negative, the motor will spin the opposite direction. And this switch over here is a momentary switch. It's a double pole, double throw. You can see right over here what the diagram looks like. So you push and hold, that's reverse, push and hold, and that's forward. Right here you can see the negative goes to the center terminal and the positive goes to the center terminal on the opposite side. When the switch is put in this position like this, you can see it's angled in that direction. It's connecting this terminal and this terminal together internally. And on the opposite side, the same two are also internally connected. These two are independent from the two on the opposite side. When the switch goes this way, you can see it's angling towards these two. So these are internally connected as well as the two on the opposite side. So negative would come in here, go to this terminal, if the switch was in this direction, transfer around. And if you look right here, you can see the wires crisscross. And then it goes over here, and these are crisscrossing. So this terminal on this side, over here, crisscrosses to this terminal. And this terminal on the inside goes to this terminal. And as a result of the crisscross pattern between these two and these two, before they connect to the motor at the top, the polarity at the motor is going to switch, causing the direction of rotation to change. You can purchase this switch online with all the connections ready to go. I'll place a link in the video description area, or you can use your own 10 amp double pole double throw momentary switch. These power window motors have a built-in overload protector. So between one of the wires here going into the motor, there is a switch in series, meaning in line with the motor. And what happens when that switch opens, power is disconnected to the motor and the motor stops turning. The way it works, it's a bimetallic strip. So this could be a strip in one hand and that's another strip. They're together. When too much current flows, maybe under excessive motor load or due to heating, the strips are going to open. When they cool in a matter of seconds, they're going to connect once again. So there's very little chance of overloading this motor because of that internal overload. In case you're wondering, all I did was bond this switch to the side of the motor in the perfect position when it's held in my hand using E6000 adhesive. Extremely strong stuff. And you can see how nicely it fits inside my hand. For this first demonstration, I just want to show you we all run into at one time or another areas where you need to remove a screw or a small bolt and it's very difficult to get to. If you use a ratchet, you're going to be banging your knuckles against maybe the floor or the wall trying to do it, especially if working under the hood of your car. You're also unable to use a nut driver because it's too long, and sometimes you can't even fit a stubby screwdriver because your hand combined with the screwdriver does not leave enough room to turn the screw. So right here just shows I can reach in behind this condensing unit, go right onto that 5 16th inch hex screw, and easily remove it. Now the next example is one that's really good because I've ran into this problem many times over the years. You could be working on framing and there's only a very small space between the studs, but you need to get in between there in the center to put screws to secure maybe a cable or a pipe and you don't want to have to do it by hand and using a drill is almost impossible to do unless the screw is placed at a very sharp angle. This tool will allow you to easily get right in there with a space as small as six and a half inches and put a screw directly into the wood. And as you just saw, the screw went in perfectly. 
You may be working underneath a sink or inside a cabinet in an area where it's very hard to position a drill and this will allow you to get in there and screw things together very easily. This tool is also extremely handy to use on your vehicle. If you're going to be removing a lot of screws or bolts, this will work extremely well. When using with Phillips and slot screws, it's not going to have any problem at all screwing them in or unscrewing them. But if you're working on bolts, you want to keep it under 10 millimeters and under 3 eighths of an inch. If those bolts have been torqued down, this tool is not going to remove them. For the last demonstration, you may need to drill a hole between two studs where your drill cannot go, or you may need to reach inside of a wall and drill a hole in a stud, allowing you to pass a wire from one side of the stud to the other, and this tool will do it with no problem. For this demonstration, I'm using a half inch spade bit. You can use smaller bits as well. Just apply the right amount of pressure and let the tool do the work. Do not force the tool. And guys, that's it. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, be sure to rate thumbs up, share, and check out my extensive video playlist for many other videos of interest to you. Thank you very much for watching.